Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Word Balloon Live. John Suntress here. I am really happy to welcome our two guests today. Uh, both have been uh, fans of Word Balloon and that really means a lot. Uh, first of all, uh, really happy to welcome uh, Whitney Matheson, who uh, has been a great uh, pop culture analyst for years. Uh, she created Pop Candy for USA Today years ago and uh, continues to be a very interesting voice in the world of uh, pop culture. Welcome, Whitney. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so psyched to be here. Me too. And Dean Haspiel, ladies and gentlemen, our returning champion, who uh, <laughs> is uh, up to about $10,000 in cash and prizes. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> Dean, as always, seriously, I am always so happy when you show up in the chat uh, when I'm talking to somebody. It's like, oh, God, look, Dean's watching. That's great. So thanks for doing that, man. Well, th thanks for having me on again. And, and you've been, uh, there's been a lot of lonely nights here at the studio. And I'm so glad when you do these late night chats. I get to hop in once in a while. Hey, man, so. seriously, it's keeping me sane. I mean, and I know uh, we're, we're going to talk about a great anthology that uh, you two have uh, put together mm -hmm. among other great artists. And um, it doesn't surprise me because, uh, you know, Dean has always corralled a lot of uh, great artist friends in the Brooklyn area to do uh, something like this. And I've actually got it here in the stream and we can even look at it and scroll. Sure. But uh, yeah. So for the Hero Initiative, a great anthology, the first volume of pandemics mm. so uh so yeah so how did this all uh, happen tell us tell us how this all came about uh i think it started with me uh i was getting emails and solicitations to contribute to other anthologies about the pandemic and as i was thinking about it i was like well you know who needs a lot of help right now are other artists and specifically other cartoonists yeah and then as we all know at one point uh the uh, major comic book companies told artists pencils down you know yes. because of everything that was going on and uh i started to think about well what can we do for ourselves right and what originally it started off as it was going to be i i i share a studio with whitney and we share a studio with about 13 or 14 other uh artists and cartoonists in brooklyn and uh I was like, I tried to rally all of those folks. Why don't we put together an anthology, you know, talk about the quarantine, talk about the pandemic. And this was before Black Lives Matter, obviously. This was happening like around March and then New York was put in pause yeah. and it was kind of a really scary time. And I was the only person coming into the studio uh, the entire time, six to seven days a week. Uh, I was wow. watering George O'Connor's plant and I was making sure that I wouldn't touch anybody's stuff. I mean, I was wearing a mask and everything. Uh, to get in and nobody else was in the building we we are in a building in gowanus uh where uh it, you know with other kinds of artists and nobody was here it, it was it was actually weirdly enough safer to be at the studio than in my apartment building where i live wow because every, everyone was you know hunkered down so i would hop on my bike carefully get to the studio come here uh and you know keep the studio in shape in some way while working 
Uh, and that's when I decided, well, let me shoot it out an email because we're getting uh, solicitations to contribute and create something. And as cool as that was, I thought, well, they'll find enough people for that. But what about us? And then when I sent out the siren, about half the studio came back at me and said, I'll, I'll join, I'll do something. And I, and I understand it. Like a lot of people, the creativity was uh, stifled or stunted or fit, that people felt paralyzed, you know? Yes. Um, oddly enough, I felt more emboldened by all this. And in fact, me and Whitney can talk about this. Uh, we collaborated on so many projects in the last three months That's that it's excellent. kind of nuts, including this one. Uh, I also knew there was no way I could do this by myself because once I started to curate and kind of invite other people, like former studio mates that now are in Philadelphia, uh, other at, you know other parts of the country, uh, I was like, I can help out creatively. You know, I'm a good idea man, and I can do my own thing. But there's no way I can admin any of this stuff. And thank God, Whitney knows how to do that and is very well versed in doing stuff like that. Uh, there's no way I could have done this this uh, this kind of project this quickly without Whitney and Josh Newfeld, who was the designer of our book. So uh, as the comics were coming in, eventually, because uh, you have to poke at people, you give them a deadline, they'll the day of the deadline is when they might send it to you. You I'm know, you, I'm <laughs> so yeah, you know what I'm talking about by midnight. So, yes, I yeah, right. So, well, it's like the Saturday Night Live thing where um, what do they say? Like, how do you know when a sketch is done on Saturday Night Live at 11:30 on Saturday night? Is it when they're you got to go do it now? You know, yep, no choice. Uh, and I was really impressed, and I want Whitney to speak to this too. But the different kinds of comics we got uh, that covered a really good spectrum. How many do we have? 15 stories. Oh gosh, something like that. We have 19 contributors and there are a few right. collaborations. So yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a good, it's a good mix. Uh, most of them are very personal, but but they range in tone. Yeah. Uh, with I think mine being the silliest of I love yours. <laughs> <laughs> Your boyfriends, I like. She it. talks about her like... pandemic boyfriends. Which, yeah, absolutely, it's, it's got yeah, a great no. punchline. It's got the best punchline. You know? so. And no, wait, that's what it. we needed. No, that's what we needed. We needed like they're serious, and then there's levity, and it, and it, I think it's a good mixed bag. Yeah. Uh, of course, once we got it, we had to put it together and figure out. Well, how do you start this, and how do you end this? Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff started to, you know, present itself and go. Oh, of course, this is where you begin, and this is how you end it. And then how do you mix it up in the middle kind of a thing, you know? Uh, and I'd say a lot of the stories are autobiographical. Um, yeah. Mine isn't. I featured my character, The Red Hook, because yeah. there was something I wanted to talk about that was so profound to me during this time, which which doesn't happen anymore right now. But um, And I don't know if this happened across the nation. I know it happened in New York. But there was this 7 o'clock appreciation for two minutes. Everyone dropped what they were doing. And they would start clapping their hands to all the first responders and everybody that was out there in this dangerous time. Yeah. And it was just so profound hearing that clapping. And and I remember the first time I heard it, I was a little jarred by it because I didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. So I used my character, The Red Hook, to tell this aspect of a story that you have to read to get. Uh, and I remember like I sometimes I'd be talking to Whitney on the phone and it'd be seven o'clock and I'd hear the clapping on her side. She'd hear the clapping on my side. and. It was always this moment that that made you stop and, and appreciate. And then I would go out and start clapping and, you know, people were banging on pots or tooting. It became like a thing. After yeah, that, you get to you know? know your neighbors that way. Sure. You know? <laughs> no, you're right. It was great. And then there, like some people were like playing horns and music in the middle of the city and yeah. people got really inventive and creative with it. Mm -hmm. So that was something I wanted to acknowledge in, in the in the anthology. And there were so many other like stories and ideas that, of course, you know, I wasn't experiencing these that the other artists were. And for them to kind of figure out a way to say something, because it's hard. I remember at nine, when 9 11 happened, uh, Jeff Mason, publisher of Alternative Comics back then, uh, called up a lot of his artists and said, Hey, we got to do something about this. Maybe we can do an anthology, some kind of benefit thing. I was like, Are you kidding me? Like, how? I don't even know what to say. I don't know what to do. And he, he reminded me that as storytellers, we have a skill set. We have these tools that allow that, you know, we may not get it right the first time. We may not get it right the last time. Right. But we have a way to discuss something uh, and, and be 
be that for people who don't have that power or don't have those tools. You know, it's kind of like I, I, I equate it to like when you go to a, a baseball game and you put on the hat of your team or put on the shirt, like there's a way to present, represent that, you know, in some way. And so as artists and storytellers during a time of crisis, we have ways to like represent it in some way. And it, it marks time, you know, yeah. yeah. Whitney. Yeah. I mean, no, no, I, I agree. You can't, I mean, you couldn't, we couldn't have gone to these contributors a year from now and asked them to do anything like this or, or we could have, but it's going to be, I mean, even if we did like another, which we might, even if we did like another volume of these comics, it would be completely different because, you know, our feelings are going to be completely different. So it really, it captures a very tight moment in time, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And and also I understand on both sides, the, uh, the initial like feeling of, okay, let's do something. Let's make something. I mean, my God, I've been doing word balloon interviews almost daily. Uh, I, I don't know started. how you're doing it, John. I don't know well, how you're doing it. Dean, it's keeping me sane, honestly, because then it's yeah. great because it's social. I get mm -hmm. to see my friends as we're doing yeah. right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and also, um, you know, uh, you'll forgive the comparison. It, it shows my age, I guess, but it kind of reminds me of what I heard about during World War II when Bob Hope was like, you know, hey, I got to do something for the home front. Our yep. boys are out, you know, fighting the good fight, and I'll uh, do what I can to entertain. Yep. And it's true, man. Yep. I mean, it's it's only gotten heavier. I mean, it started yep. with the the pandemic, then the demonstrations. And, uh, you know, it's like we're almost in free fall sometimes, and I can appreciate that. And some people, and even recently, have said, hey, you should talk to Portland creators about the madness that's going on right now. And it's like, you know, this is an oasis to have fun and and not not ignore the news, but mm -hmm. get away for a second. Let's mm -hmm. let's remind ourselves what we love about comics and and have some great conversations. And thankfully everybody has been available and right. uh, you know, and I've got enough of a Rolodex having done this for 15 years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I can call my friends. And like I said, Dean, you're you're you know one of the people that every time you pop in, it's like, oh we got to do one, man. Come on. And Whitney, <laughs> good lord. I and seriously this is my chance face to face to thank you because you know, a good 10 years ago, I was on a subway platform heading to work, and uh, the guys from iFanboy are like, hey, there's a list of uh, the top 10 best comic book podcasts out there. And I open up the article, and I'm scrolling. I'm like, oh, yeah, all my friends are in here. This is cool. And I'm going down from 10 to 1, and I'm like, all right, all right. I'm like, oh, you know, I, I you know, maybe I'll be on this. I don't know. And then, oh, my, my God, you, you made me number one. And that's seriously, <laughs> good Lord. I was yeah. floored, 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 and I still am. So oh, thank right. you. Truly, Aww. I I do I, I miss those i fanboy guys too. They were, they were great as well. <laughs> they're uh, out there. They're still they're still they're still cranking. Yeah. So yeah. you know, I mean, it's no, it's uh, it's great. Uh, and again, this is uh, it, it's a time to at least help each other out and and do what we can. And you know, I'm glad this book is for the Hero Initiative, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'll be uh, participating. It's a chance for me to mention again. I've, I've said it online. Haven't said it much on the show. Uh, I'll be with uh, the mainframe Comic Con guys next month, August fifteenth and sixteenth, and we're going to do panels and put together a convention for the Hero Initiative as well. And uh, we got great, uh, great creators lined up, and it's going to be great. It's the third one that they've done. I was involved with the first one, did a couple panels for them, and I'll be involved with this one. But yeah, it's like, hey, what can we do to help and also entertain right. during this very weird time? Well, when we were figuring out like <clears throat> when to release this, I was like. If it if it was a, if it was during a normal time, we could not have gotten. Well, we may maybe could have gotten to a printer and flown to San Diego Comic Con and debuted it there. But because that's not happening, but concurrently, what is happening is there's going to be about 300 panels that San Diego Comic Con is doing like this week, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, we got to do it the week of San Diego, but the day before. <laughs> so I we're understand. Not competing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Which is why we're also glad we're talking to you about it, like the night before, to hopefully drive some folks, and then hopefully this will be up, you know, in repeat format, you know. Oh, so absolutely. Well, you know, can revisit, you know. Yeah, man. No, the you know, obviously the the videos will be up, and then also uh, I'll, I'll post the audio as well. I was going to put it out on uh, on Thursday, right? Uh, as far as that goes, and no, you know, they have legs. So no, a few thousand people will check it out, and uh, I, just because we've been editors of this for a little while right now, while working on other projects, I guess I want to ask you. Besides doing this, what was your what is but what more dramatically was your quarantine like at first for you? You know what's weird, Dean? I um I 
well, first of all, I was working at the the CBS news station in my day job. And um, so we started uh, broadcasting from home. I can't remember now if it was before St. Patrick's Day or after, but it was around that time. And um, all I, well, and also last year I had this weird leg infection that I've recovered mm-hmm. from and mm-hmm. everything's fine now if people are wondering. And so I had to be on lockdown then. I was in the hospital for five weeks, but then they wouldn't let me go back to work for another two months. So I really was kind of stuck inside and very limited walking for, for a couple months. So it wasn't hard for me to do this. And also in my work in radio, I'm sitting in a studio mm-hmm. already isolated. So it, it didn't bother me. I knew how to be productive during that kind of thing. And and like so many other people, um, when it was, hey, I'll, this is a chance to learn a language or get your comic collection in order or learn a musical instrument or something. And I had been meaning to do video for a long time, just didn't have the time to do it. Right. So I was like, all right, well, let me figure this out. So well, the I, joke, my- I, I think the joke for a lot of cartoonists was it's not that different being a quarantine. Yep. So we're kind of prepared for this. Sadly, we're, yes. We're sadly isolated a lot. And uh, and in a way, I was afraid that when the studio, everyone was like locked down, I was the only one coming in. I was afraid that I would freak out and have a lot of cabin fever. And I do have some cabin fever still, but I kind of got used to it. And I realized it was okay to be actually alone, if that makes sense. I mean, the reason why I go to a studio is to be energized by the other creativity in the room, you know? Uh, And luckily, you know, Whitney is a studio mate. Like we are able to communicate a lot, you know? And she was kind of like my right hand man in a lot of ways, right hand woman. Sorry, <laughs> um, you know, and, and a lot of, and, and just be able to talk about stuff, you know, and, and deal with what's going on. And, and when I talked to Whitney uh, about New York City, like, and one of the reasons why we're here, although I'm a native New Yorker, I'm here, I, I don't know what it's like to not be here. Um, it is really difficult to be in a big city. You're in Chicago, right? Right, I'm in, I'm in the city, yeah. Like, I, lo- I was supposed to have a play launch March 19th. We had to shutter that, you know. Yeah. It, I, I already I had seen a full re- so did Whitney, you saw it too, a full, you know, rehearsal of it. We uh, knew it was gonna be like next week. Next week uh, never happened. Yeah. Movies, <laughs> theaters, small space black box spaces where people are hunkered in together. Um, you know, we would go see this play Saturday night. Uh it's getting tired, Mildred, directed and, and written uh, produced by uh, this great guy, Roger Nasser and, and his cast. You know, you expect to do these things because you're in a big city and there's a lot of cool stuff happening. Not that's not happening anymore. And when you. will it happen? I don't know. I hear you, man. Yeah, and Whitney, I'm sure yeah. you feel the same way. I mean, I, I oh. live right around music bars that you know was nothing to literally walk by and hear what's going on and go, oh great, let me buy a ticket. I'll, I'll walk in. I mean, I was doing that constantly in my neighborhood, and and I think to not only uh, those situations and plays, stand up. I mean, everything that live, just live entertainment. And how it's been affected. So yeah, please, Vit, when you know, yeah, tell us your thoughts yeah, on this. Yeah, I yeah, I I've had a very difficult time. I even among the uh, you know other members of the PTA, I was known as Rock and Roll Mom because I went <laughs> out a lot during the week, and yeah, to suddenly um, all of a sudden have everything I let. Well, no, uh, no more like movie theaters and concerts and plays and bookstores and museums and all of that stuff that I needed almost every day. I, you know, like a lot. Yeah, it's all gone. Like I still, I have a hard time with it. It is hard. It's a little bit better now that like a few things have opened up, uh, but. But oh my gosh, yeah, I I hate it. I hate every <laughs> every minute of it. I hate yeah. every day. I you know I I lived in New York for a while, and then when um, it, my daughter was little, and after I left USA Today, I went down to Tennessee for a few years. Mm-hmm. And, and when she was until and then when she was back, like old enough to go to school, I came back to New York. And I'm also just mad because it's like, oh my gosh, I fought hard to get back here. And as soon as I get back here and I start getting stuff going, everything's gone. Like it's all gone. 
And like, yeah, it's, it is a struggle. And so as a result of that, I think I have just thrown a lot of energy and time into work um, because that's, it, that's the distraction I need and it helps me stay sane. Well, like you were saying, like, yeah, just, so I have been more like productive and perhaps more creative in the last few months than I have in the last like several years. Um, well, you do a, a weekly newsletter. I don't know how you do this weekly and, and, and find really cool stuff to talk about still, but you also, because a lot of the stuff kind of got shuttered and there's a lot of pop culture that's, you know, put on pause in a lot of ways, you were really inventive with your newsletter you, you, and, and a current project you're working on right now. It's, you're very innovative. Well, you know, you got to mix it up. You have to be, keep yourself entertained, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I send that newsletter cause I do have, you know, I'm a freelancer. My day, I, I do all sorts of writing for, money like pr stuff and ghost writing and all sorts of like crazy things great um, but then yeah also like the newsletter that's a good thing where i feel like i can experiment and be a little creative and then yeah this month i've been doing this thing where every day i post like a uh like a five minute creative challenge on instagram and there they can be strange and sometimes people participate in them and sometimes they don't um <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, whatever, it's a pandemic that we could have, you know, 24 hours left. So it doesn't like, let's do whatever. Who cares? You might as well try it all. Agreed. Yeah. Well, tell me about the newsletter. What, uh, I mean, is it a, are, are, is it a close knit uh, group or is it available to anybody? What are you doing? Oh yeah. It's free and available to, to anybody and it's every week. And uh, that also, because also around when all this started as Dean knows very well, I, I got sick with something that may or may not have been, I had COVID symptoms. Okay. It was at, the, at the time, it was impossible to get a test. So who knows? By the time I could get a test, it was negative. But um, yeah, so I was sick for a really long time, like just like bad, all, all, the, all the stuff, except the super high fever. And I fortunately wasn't in the hospital. Um, so all that to say, yes, the newsletter was also just a way for me to have this like weekly connection with people. Um, and and I even did it when I wasn't feeling so well because I knew after I would send it out, I would feel much better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it can be a mix of things. Like um, I might, usually I give recommendations and people send me, it's sort of pop candy-ish. Like people send me what they're doing or um, or I might throw, throw something crazy. I might like just, share a short story that I wrote or something unexpected. Yeah. I That's don't cool. so, talking about myself. Do you no, know? I know, but, uh, but we want people to know about it and get it. So <laughs> how, how, like, how do you get it? How do we get it? Oh, well you can find it. I, actually, you should just go to my Patreon and you can get a link to where you can subscribe. So at Patreon and patreon.com slash Whitney Matheson. Lovely. And yeah, there's a link to where you can subscribe. You can get it for free. And then if you feel like giving me like $2 a month to support me, you can, but I understand if you can't, it comes up to That's how's Patreon working for you, Whitney? Cause I've been doing it for several years now as well. And you know, it's, yeah, uh, it's part of the mix here. Yeah, it's it's all right. I, I, could, I could Patreon better. I could probably use some tips, but well, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's do it all right. It's good. I'll tell you, like it is good to have an outlet because I do a variety of different projects. So it is it is good to have this one place where if people want to read a five thousand word short story that I wrote, like you know, they can go there and get it. Or cool. if they want to see like weird little comics that I draw about stuff my daughter says, you know. So it's, <laughs> it's really good to have. How old is your daughter? Uh, she's seven. Adorable. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's yeah. excellent. Very good. And, and is she okay? Is she handling this weirdness okay? Oh, yeah. I mean, she's a talker, so she doesn't stop talking from the moment she wakes up till the time <laughs> she goes to bed. But I, she's doing all right. But, oh, man, I, I hope she can – I hope they find a way to do some part-time school because yeah. I, I'm not meant to teach math at all. Amen. I hear yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> No, Dean, I uh, I read your story in Pandemics, and I'm glad that the Red Hook is a big part right. of it. And just like Billy Dogma, I love how you put yourself in these 
stories and, and they really are kind of a cipher for what you're going through. It's I mean, cool. abs and thank you. And absolutely. I mean, it's, I created one avatar, Billy Dogma, and then transitioned it somehow to Red Hook. And then I realized my initial plans for the Red Hook started to evolve back into kind of a Billy Dogma comic, oddly enough, because it got a little cosmic and weird. Yes. And, <laughs> but I wanted with, with this story, I wanted to this little short, you know, bit for pandemics. Yeah. I wanted to keep it as real as possible because of what was happening. And and I actually cast a neighbor in it, you know, and I took some snapshots. Uh, of my building area and just to keep it a as authentic as possible, you know, but I think what we're all talking about Is the desire for human connection, you know, like you're doing this because you need to connect, you know Whitney does a newsletter and Instagram, you know uh, Stories and whatnot to connect or even yes. doing the like podcast, you know we, We've even done yeah. a couple little podcast recording type stuff and great or, or like uh, Whitney's done that as well. Just talking, you know to the ether for a half hour and put it out there to connect with people. Uh, I mean, as there's a lot of it going on right now, but you find your people by putting yourself out there, you know, and eventually it'll yeah. boomerang back and people will communicate back to you, you know? So, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that was part of me trying to connect with the studio initially before it became a broader uh, anthology was, Hey, how are you, how are you all doing? What's going on? You know, how are you handling this right now? And to me, that was important. And then when we decided, okay, this isn't gonna be for the studio, well, who could this be for? And I was thinking, oh, the Hero Initiative, because they're taking care of us when we get older, yes. right? Yes. That's, that's part of the idea, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so I'm kind of investing in myself or in my colleagues, you know, in some way, by doing stuff like this, you Absolutely. know? Absolutely, yeah. And, and we just gotta toot the horn, spread the word, you know, uh, it's, it's five bucks, you know, come on, you know, so, you get a 56 page comic, you know, it's, and it's a great comic. And I would say, uh, for people who like, uh, McSweeney's, uh, collection of comics and when they would do those. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, I love the different styles as I was scrolling, you were seeing uh, Josh Newfield, um, yep, yep. uh, images and stuff. And I can actually scroll down. And, yeah, go uh, ahead. Give it, give it a nice, you know, a tease. Absolutely, <laughs> go through yeah. it. Well, why don't you guys? Yeah, as I'm doing this, why don't you guys like rattle well, off uh, names of creators that are there? There's Marguerite. Jo there's Marguerite Dubai, uh, which I think we're going to sneak peek that at uh, the comics beat tomorrow. Oh, hey, uh, great! Yeah, and we we did we had a couple of those happening today. Josh Ufeld wrote this great six page story about his brother. Uh, this is a, a studio mate of ours, Peter Rostovsky. Who yeah. wrote this beautiful five page story? Gorgeous art. I mean, my um, God. Yeah. Great story. And it was also a way for wow. some of our artists are also like experimenting new styles with this anthology. I wondered. You know? That's fantastic. So, so Peter was trying uh, test testing like this watercolor kind of effect. And I thought it came out really nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's beautiful. And this and Joan Riley, Riley. Riley, studio mate, who lives in Pennsylvania now, uh, came up with this great, beautiful one pager. Oh, yeah, there's Rona Routine uh, is Stephen Harris, and it was great to get this piece. And it's it's like this this kind of grayscale, stark black and white story yes. about about what we ha have to do in order just to come home and like you know clean the items we bought and yeah. try to you know mimic normality somehow in our homes. And uh, I thought that was really important. Like as simple as that is. You know, that's the kind of thing that Whitney was saying. If you asked him to write this a year from now, he might forget this. Yeah. You know, and this is like yes. a document of this time right now. You know, absolutely. Of them, no question, man. 100%. Yeah. Christian Radke. She had done this for the New York Times, and we and it was a different format. And so me and Josh uh, cobbled together from her when she agreed to let us use it to turn it into a three page comic. And this was a really, it's about skin hunger about touch, about yeah. the lack of touch, you know, during this. Yes. And Jeez. Whitney, you jump in as well. I, I don't want to dominate. No, 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 you're, you're doing all right. So here we go. Uh, yeah. 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 No, it's, that's the concern is, yeah, are we gonna, what are we gonna no, lose in the new normal? Yes, indeed. Here we go. <laughs> Hilarious. So, so we actually, uh, let's, let's read this in real time. So let, yeah. you want to do a little, Whitney, yeah, you should do a little, little, little reading. You Okay. Well, no, no, I'm not going to read. People can see. Look, I, I don't draw ever. I don't draw anything. So 
Yeah. Whitney's, Whitney's the natural cartoonist. Whitney's Whitney, this is great. Cartoonist. What are you talking about? I understand, but seriously, you did it. It's great. <laughs> it's funny as hell. It's a very I, adorable. I really just love <laughs> having to make people laugh. <laughs> I'm spoiling right now. I'm sorry. It's, it's great. It's, it's great. Spoiler. It's great. <laughs> that's awesome. Seriously, that's fantastic. And then we go see this is what I mean in terms of for the for the viewers and listeners. And I'm sorry, I know I'm putting this out as an audio. Uh, well, it's only going to make you guys uh, have to see it to yeah. believe it. Oh, but really, it's got this real McSweeney kind of feel. So I think you curated this and, and put it together in a really positive way. I think it's great. Th thank you. I mean, I, I'm always looking out, you know, for a good balance between mainstream looking kind of comics versus yep. really alternative. I mean, that's that's my wheelhouse is trying in my own work, trying to find, you know, I mean, I'm a big Jack Kirby fan, as you know, I, oh, I love yeah. C.C. Beck. I love yeah. Ditko, Eisner, Toth, Frank Miller. But then I also love a lot of the alternative cartoonists, like growing up, you know, around Dan Clouds and that kind of stuff. And, you know, just even, you know, palling up with Bob Fingerman, you know, who was like a big 90s indie cartoon. And he does comedy oh, yeah. still. Oh, yeah. But like, or Jessica Abel, you know. From, uh, just, yes. I like that mashup, you know. Uh, and some of these comics are silent, and then you can, you know, interpret them yourselves or inject yeah. yourself into the comic. You know, um, this is yeah. Morgan Pielli who did like, a really cool comic. I like his because it's all about trying to date during a pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> which, unbelievable. Which he started doing. Yeah, he's actually doing it. Oh my God, that's amazing! He, he started a relationship during the pandemic. Yes, yes, that's insane. Jeez, yeah. beautiful stuff, man. Oh, no, Dave, Dave Proach is is <laughs> one of my favorite uh, alternative. He 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 couldn't be more authentic. And then he did this crazy ass kind of like poster about all the plagues. <laughs> and and when we finally got to the current plague, which is I think to the bottom right, yeah, yep. coronavirus is stay woke. <laughs> and like there's this bizarre looking characterization. I love it so much. I was laughing at this today actually. It's uh, unbelievable. Jen Ferguson. Oh, and Jen, Jen, did, Jen has been working on this pandemic journal. Uh, she's been writing notes for every day of it and then producing certain days. She claims she's going to try and do one for every day of the pandemic, which wow. I think is insane. But this was like a select choice, uh, like six or seven that we pulled from her journal that she's been working on. And I, I, I predict that this is going to be like, this is just like a, a, a tease to a, a book that she'll hopefully put together and publish. I can see that. Absolutely. You know? man. And it's really cool because it kind of, kind of is evocative of like, I don't know, like a creepy New Yorker, you know, like this, or, but also really cute stuff as well. Like this, you know, uh, I, I know she's a fan of Moomin uh, comics and stuff like that. And uh, I just love, it, it just feels very authentic New York style, you know, yeah. like something you might see or, um, <laughs> oh, who's the guy? Uh, Maurice Sendak. A little bit of Maurice. Like, yeah, it's a I can real see good that. mashup. Certainly. Of, of that kind of stuff, you know? And wow. I'm, I'm really impressed. I could never do anything like this. It's almost like mural comics. Absolutely. You know? No, and again, this is why the different formats that everyone is choosing to storytell. And it reminds me, Dean, of your uh, collective Activate back in the day. Oh, and, my God. You know, you know I've, been, I've been thinking about that a lot. Really? Uh, John, about like how to bring back and monetize, activate via an app, you know, kind of like Webtoon, you know? We're scrolling yes. past uh, We're scrolling past the story that George O'Connor uh, gave us. Uh, he he interpreted a friend's uh, experience yes. in an elevator uh, with someone who should have been wearing a mask while coughing and sneezing and so on and so forth. And again, this is classic. This is something, not you wouldn't necessarily forget, but you wouldn't necessarily write and draw, but this is necessary, this kind of comic. You know, to a, to a uh, a story like what's going on today, totally. You know, but yeah, regarding act, I mean, listen, as much of a hassle as anthologies are and group efforts, trust me, as much of a hassle <laughs> it is, it's also very worth it. Like ultimately, to have this documentation, this kind of collective. Um, oh, Franco, thank you, um, and. And and maybe to figure out projects that are more sustaining, like that, you know, we're talking about Patreon, right? Like everyone can have their own individual Patreon, but there's something to the group effort, to the, you know, that where you, where you piggyback off each other's sensibilities, where Absolutely. someone might, someone might come for you, John, but then walk away going, what, who's Whitney? You know, like, 
or Dean or, or you know, or however many you want to put in this box. You Absolutely, know? man. And yeah. then and then you pick a day and that's your day, you know, and if there's seven days to a week, you can do an activate type thing, you know, where everyone gets a day, you know, and, and then realize, oh, you're revisiting that site every day of the week because this is some cool stuff. It's outlier stuff, you know. It was, uh, Dean, I came to activate for you and discovered uh, Simon Fraser and Mike Cavallero. Yep, yep. And, yep. Uh, and God, and I'm, and I'm blanking on some other names offhand, Tim, and I'm forgetting Tim's Tim name. Tim Hamilton, Michelle Fife. Michelle um, Fife, absolutely, yes. Uh, I'm trying to think of other people. Josh Neufeld, I think, was there as well. Josh, absolutely, yes. Uh, Leland Purvis, and I'm probably, uh, I think it's one or two other people at the at the onset, you know, yeah, of course yeah. it turned into like 50, 60 people and became unwieldy, you know, but that's, <laughs> that's cool. You know, that's cool too. Yeah. No, but I'm I am thinking you. about like the future, like as, as we should, you know, uh, how, how can we control our destinies better? You know, Dante Hicks, uh, George O'Connor is such a great guy. I always uh, look forward to seeing him at uh, fan expo Boston every year. Very nice. Thanks Dante. Absolutely. Thanks. That's great. And like Mike Cavallero, you know, he does the back cover, which we love. The star, mm -hmm. it's like a Star Wars inspired back. I was gonna cover. say, I can get back, can get back to right, scrolling. It's right there behind, under, on top of my finger, right, right. up there. Oh, yeah, right, there it is. Oh, that's it's hanging awesome. right there. Here, I'll but, but you can see it on here as well, and and that was also it's it's literally the back the back cover. If you yeah. want to, I'll scroll. I'll scroll down. Oops, one second. Oops. Nope. Oh no. Yeah, oh God, no. secrets. Oh God. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Jeez. That's okay. I think All it's right. the one that's called uh, Pandemic Final. Yeah. Pandemic's okay. Final. Oh, this is cover though. It's right oh, there, there. We go. Oh, Whoa. there we go. So right. I I asked Mike. <laughs> I asked Mike at like at like right before deadline. I said, Hey Mike, could you do something? We need one illustration. You, you got to be in this. Cause he, he had written, he was another guy that couldn't think of anything. Right. Okay. To, to tell a story. And I said, Mike, and it was like three o'clock in the afternoon. He said, all right, it, if I don't get you something by tonight, I can't do it. By 10 o'clock that night, he invented this thing, you know, <laughs> which was basically a, a, a parody or an homage to the yeah. original star Wars poster. Absolutely. But he recast the characters to be, and Chewbacca alone is worth the price of admission on that Hold cover. Got to get it back. All right. So funny. I don't know if you can get close in on that, but the, I, down a little bit. He's got like this this hipster. Oh, there he is. I need a haircut. Right. It's like this hipster, you know, Williamsburg guy with a long beard saying, "I need a haircut." <laughs> Might as well be Chewbacca. Uh, it's, it's so all right. good. You know, I'm still. I'm sorry. I'm still getting uh, used to doing this as far that's as okay, showing images right. and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike's so, great, man. That's hilarious. No, but and and honestly, like we could have, we could easily fill another volume or two, you know, if we wanted to. And and w one of the things I asked Josh Ufeld to do when we were designing it, and for the contributors when they submitted, high res. Let's let's build it as a book. Yes, we'll show it as a digital download PDF but build it as a book so that in case we do want to print it or we maybe want to add to it, you know, kind of thing and, and expand on it. And, you know, maybe we'll get a publisher, in, you know, contacting us and deal with the grunt work of that, you know, while we just create and make stuff, you know, sure. but we'll see how that goes. But, but none of the monies go to us at all. This is all going to the hero initiative. Like literally Whitney set up the pan, the Patreon, you, you pay for it; it goes directly yeah. to the Hero Initiative. So it has its own it has its own Patreon page. That's how you guys are selling it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so what's so it's Patreon.com slash Pandemics. What's the? Uh, I think it. there it cool. is. <laughs> okay, I figured. Uh, you know, again, being yeah. a Patreon guy. Okay, that's right. Makes sense. That's great. And five dollars. Five dollars, and if you want, if you're feeling generous, we have the hero level and then the superhero level. And the superhero level is the $20 where you donate more money. You still get the digital PDF, but you can also get a print version of Mike Cavallero's back cover, the Star Wars Outstanding. Theme, if you and want to print it out. Yeah, printable, not print. We're not mailing it to people. Oh, that's right. It's printable. Sorry. Yeah. What, you right. know, I do that for when when people uh, support me on Patreon. I call it the League of Word Balloon Listeners. And I found a domino mask that is proper size that people can print out and if they oh, want to cool. make, because I always say I'll send you a cape and a domino mask so you're part of the league. 
Oh, yeah, that's, that's cool. So, you know, yeah, and it's all virtual, obviously. But the, the mask is cute life-size, so people can print it if they want to and make their own little domino mask. That's awesome. That so, is awesome. Well, you know, you yeah, try. We, yeah, we, were, <laughs> we had to think about, like, you know, how to engage and who to talk to and try to get in the word out, you know. Uh, and we're, we're doing that as of today, you know, like throughout the week and, and you know, throughout August. Because th I, I think the pandemic's not going to go away right away. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, uh, really. this will still be um, – have a value to it, as well as the fact that it's just helping out cartoonists in need at the end of the day, you know? so I, I just tweeted out the URL, patreon.com. I want to make sure I spelled it right. Uh, slash pandemics, P-A-N-D-E-M-I-X. That's, That's right. It. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Excellent. As opposed Thank to you. spelling Whitney Matheson with Whitney Shepard, as I did <laughs> blurry eyed this morning. And I, again, I, I have, have a no theory. Idea. I have Tell a me. theory. Please. Because I think of Whitney as a shepherd of like cool. <laughs> she shepherds the things that are cool. Right. That's a, that what he said. That's it. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's, that's what happened. Okay, <laughs> that's what happened. Whitney, honestly, is as a pop culture analyst, um, I I can take myself out of the madness and am fascinated by um, the necessary reaction that all of media has had to do to adjust to this new normal, and from from news to entertainment and movies that have no choice but to stream. To get out there and then yeah. the television that's being made. I was watching uh, the 30 Rock special last week that also served as an upfront for, for NBC. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as a broadcaster, no, I, I can't I can't deny I am fascinated watching all this stuff. And I wonder if you had any observations of uh, what we're witnessing. I mean, it is interesting because some of it translates and some of it just doesn't. I mean, I it's hard to. Some of the Zoom, when they've tried to do a show and the, everybody's on Zoom, like, some of it's like, oh, this isn't totally working. It's not, doesn't, I don't really feel like I'm connecting with it. But um, you know what I kind of do, I have like the little bit is some of, uh, I, I never watched late night TV really before this, or at least like, you know, all the people who currently do it. But some of them are, are kind of good. like the cruder, like the simpler they are. Like, you know, like Seth Myers is in his what, like attic or something. Yeah. Like they're, they're so simple and like pared down. And like sometimes, you know, their kids will come interrupt that. Like for me, that does translate. And that's actually maybe even <laughs> better. Like I prefer it to, you know, this old school like fake stuff that they were doing before. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting to see how I, I don't mind that movies are now being released on online, although I miss a movie theater. Yeah. So badly, so badly. Oh. No, I hear you. And they keep kicking, obviously, and I understand why, but yeah, they keep kicking these movies down the road. Obviously, uh, Christopher Nolan's Tenet gets uh, rescheduled once again. Um, yeah, I, and I, and um, did it make you buy more streaming? services because i can yeah. write them off and i and and i and i even i picked up apple uh i haven't watched it yet um but i will watch that uh, tom hanks world war ii movie greyhound i think oh, that looks really hey. interesting i want to see that i actually was listening to uh conan o'brien talk to tom hanks about yeah, it that's good yeah hey, i listened to that you listen to it what? I, yeah i told I you i didn't realize how much i love tom hanks now because it, He's just adorable. Oh, yeah, he's turned into, I told you, he was America's dad, now he's America's grandpa. It's adorable. <laughs> he's okay. Jimmy Stewart. He's, not, he's totally Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, yeah. but it, I will say the one thing I have increased, I, I feel like I maybe, like I did pick up HBO Max. Like there are a couple things, but I listen to more podcasts now than I Yay. did. And I listened to a decent amount before, but. I think part of it is too, now that I'm like, I don't have too many like Zoom meetings, but I do have that occasionally, but I'm looking at a screen so much now that sometimes at night, I just, I'm, I don't want to watch. You're screened out. I'm yeah, up. yeah. But podcasts, and I also just, I like that human connection, you know? I completely agree. And, and that's why I wanted to do podcasting initially, especially coming from radio and, um, I like growing this new audience on on YouTube and Facebook and everything. And it is, in a lot of ways, 
independent of what I was doing on audio. A lot of people are discovering me this way mm -hmm. that weren't before. And I, and I, I mean, I, I knew the importance of like YouTube. I mean, you hear it all the time from the analysts that, you know, next to Google, it's the second place that everybody goes to. So I'm like, all right. And there was even part of me because there are so many good uh, comic v uh, video casts. I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I'm like, am I intruding or whatever? And I got over it pretty fast, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. no, I, you know, I got my content. I got I'm, my show's unique enough. I'm, I'm okay. And again, thankfully, I've got the Rolodex that, uh, you know, having done it for 15 years, I could ask good, talented people to give me good content. But yeah, it's a, uh, it's interesting. It is interesting. I have to admit. And I, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I think that, um, speaking to what Whitney was saying about late night talk shows. Yes. It does work really well, and you start to realize, or maybe they're realizing, just like a lot of companies are realizing, why we have offices. I, I don't think anybody really wants to work at home all the time. No, you know, I think people like to go to work, which is why I like to go to a studio. Yeah. Um, but I do think if if you know the things that you know, I, I think I'm going to go very off for a second, but like one of the things I explore in my Red Hook comic in New Brooklyn is that uh, art is currency. You can exchange, um, you know, art for food and services and stuff. And I think that money has gotten so out of control in the world, America, that we need to change to what we think about what money is, you know, and what things cost. Things shouldn't cost as much as they do, I don't think, you know, and it's nuts. And so we have like these corporations that are renting all these offices. Maybe you don't need all those offices. Maybe you can do it a little bit differently and get the, and the work is getting done. People need a purpose. People want to do things, you know? Sure. Um, and so I think that is, has been an interesting kind of fallout from this. So then we have like talk shows that can do it from home and you can talk to someone in their living room. And it's kind of cute. Cause you're like, Oh, that's the, well, that's a picture in their home. In yeah. The you're checking out their book, checking out their bookshelves and everything. Yeah. Or man. they're faking it or something. Or even when <laughs> SNL had a, a they, did, did a attempts at this, there was some funny yeah. stuff that happened because of it. Oh you yeah. Know? But I do agree that to try to make a Zoom show right now doesn't necessarily work. And I did not see the 30 Rock thing. And I, and I, I earmarked that because I do want to watch the 30, Mark, the 30 Rock special and see what they did. But because of this, one of the projects, and I can't talk about it too much, that me and, me and Whitney decided, well, let's try to make. You can't say too much. Then say, you, you say, say you're good at it. Sorry, you, go ahead, go ahead. I'll tell you if you guys stop talking. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to say what it's about, mm -hmm. but part of the conceit was can we create a TV show that incorporates some sense of social distancing in it? And that's all. And I think we yeah. succeeded at least. Uh, this Jeff. Oh, oh, he's, he's, he in, was, anthology. he's in the that's anthology. That's yes. excellent, man. Which we'll scroll down and show some more of that. Yes, uh, yes. And he's he's local to us, and he's one of our one of my. One, he's a, he's basically an honorary studio mate in a lot of ways. You okay, know? a great writer. Um, but uh, yeah, so we we came up with, and part of the conceit was to keep it low budget, a sense of social distancing, and uh, we're having talks. Let's just say uh, uh, with some professional people about this. We'll see what happens. That's but cool. we were very inspired by the pandemic to create something uh, as a result of it. If that makes sense, it okay, does without, without saying too much. Yeah, um, I the best thing that comes out of this is that it does force you to do things a different way. You know, yes. it's forcing it's forcing musicians to like perform in different ways and try to make money in different ways. And you know, I've had friends. Oh, I have. I had a friend who made this video on zoom with his band and they're all in different you know they're all in their houses and they're all like playing their different parts and like there's like a singer and like she's holding her baby and like oh it's just it it's hard but it, it is forcing us to be a little bit you know creative and think differently about how we can make things i get it absolutely dean i want to ask before i forget um and you know it's a, it's a hopefully you know, there'll be some pleasant memories, but we lost Denny O'Neill and oh, yeah. I, I know. Yeah. And I, and I know your connection to, to Denny and Larry. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, if you had any like you know good memories of of didn't you didn't you intern at Den with uh, Denny? So yeah. so um, Denny, I believe was the first first professional comic book guy to basically sanction me and give me a shot in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, when uh, Larry O'Neill, his son, is one of one of my old friends from from back in the high school days. Yeah. Um, you know, he wanted to make comics before he went on to do film, uh, which, you know, there's a sensibility share there, you know, Absolutely. storytelling. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, and even using, you know, storyboarding and thinking of the panel in the same way absolutely. that filmmakers, you know, use the camera. Right. Absolutely. Right. So, like, and at one point, uh, he got hip that uh, Upstart Studios needed uh, a, a, an assistant. And Upstart Studios at that time was Howard Chaikin, Walter Simonson, and Jim Sherman. Previously, that studio housed Frank Miller, Jim Starlin, and I think Val Myrick. And uh, down the hall was another studio with Bill Sienkiewicz, Dennis Cowan, and Michael Davis. Wow. So I was a little jealous of Larry who got to go and, you know, work on American flag with Howard Chaikin and whatnot. <laughs> and I kind of, and then, and that was because of Denny. You know, the, uh, Howard was reaching out to Denny saying, hey, do you know anybody? Maybe, you know, and Howard knew Larry. And then, like shortly thereafter, I think Bill Sienkiewicz decided he wanted to be like Howard Chaikin and have an assistant. Although I don't know, I mean, I did some stuff. I worked on New Mutants and Electra Assassin. Wow! Uh, but there, I couldn't be a, a more opposite artist than Bill at the time, you know. But I did do stuff, and and you know, it was really great to be in that room with Dennis and Bill and Michael, and then go down the hall and hang out with Chaikin and Simonson and start working on. And then there was less work from Bill, and he was going back to Connecticut a lot. And then I eventually transitioned to become Howard's second assistant on Flag, and then a little bit on Thor with Simonson, wow. and then some other projects, right? And yeah. it was a very heady yeah. 1985 for me, 17 going on 18. Wow. I think I walked into that studio of Virgin and left it <laughs> de -virgin. It's not because of the studio, but <laughs> anyway, uh, I was a late starter. Um, so, um, <laughs> but, but Denny was in the background of all that, you know? And and in fact, at one point when I lived with Larry O'Neill in Soho on uh, Thompson between Spring and Broom, that was Denny's apartment during the era of when he wrote those great Batman stories and then Iron Man and whatnot. And, you know, Green Lantern, Green Arrow with Neil Adams, you know, these Jeez. these classic, famous perennials, you know, yeah, of yeah. what became perennial. Yes. Um, and then, uh, you know, there were many years where I didn't see him, but, you know, he's always in the background. And then the last time I saw him, I believe, yes, it was Baltimore Comic Con when he was there last, which was like, was it last year? It might have been last year or the year before. I don't remember. And he was, it was, it's one of those classic stories. There's all these famous people all around, or everyone's commiserating, and the young kids have no idea that that's Denny O'Neill sitting by himself eating dinner at the bar among all, you know, other old timers might know, and, or there's Denny, you know. And I was like, damn. I got to go sit with Denny, you know? And speaking of Jeffrey Burent, who just wrote on, he saw yeah. me and he, I said, come on. And he, he wanted to sit with us. And we, he, and Denny would share stories and hang out. And, you know, he, he and there, there's Jeffrey. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it was just like, just being able to talk to a guy who was such a, a master, but just a person, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then um, when he passed away, Larry emailed me. And uh, he'd reach out to certain friends to let them know first kind of thing. Yeah. And then I made sure to hang out with Larry one, uh, a couple of times after that, you know, That's and great, we've man. kept in touch since. And in fact, Whitney met Larry. And one of the things we do during this pandemic <laughs> is uh, Zoom games. You know, we are playing games on Zoom once in a while. Sure. Like car games or all kinds nice. of silly stuff, you know. And Larry is like a master poker player and other, and other games. He's really into strategy a lot. Um, okay, yeah. it's really difficult to defeat him. <laughs> he loves words. He's a word master, as is Whitney. They 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 make a good team. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. not fun to play against them. I'll put it that way. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> so no, that's great. No, but 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 Denny, like, listen, a master storyteller, master editor. Uh, his contribution to the forum will be heralded, you know, forever. You know, and uh, I I don't. When someone's older and they pass away, you know, people go, damn it. Like, it's almost like you took him away too soon. It's like, he did so much. He did yeah. such, like, yeah. look at it. Just go look at his career, you know? When totally. Harvey Picard passed away, 
And I was asked like, well, how do you feel? I was like, well, it's really sad. But if you want to know about Harvey Pekar, there's 30 years of comics literally about Harvey Pekar. The only story he didn't get to tell was the one that we get to tell is that he passed away. You don't write that story. You don't get to yeah. it. Yeah. You know, so. Anyway. No, I hear you, man. No, Jesus. Uh, you know, uh, you you might remember when uh, I, had, I had interviewed Denny back in 2006 and it was great. And then he just had those years of just bad health issue yeah he and died every, he died before uh before he died he died yeah uh, he was he, like right, a he had a heart attack. yes he had a heart attack and he would have been dead had there not been a defibrillator like in the restaurant or next door or whatever it was he literally was like dead for like a minute or two yeah. and then they pumped him back to life so yeah. you know and then i believe was it your interview that he talks about the the novel he wrote it was kind of like a memoir yes and i remember buying that and i started to read it and like i had to put it down and I will get to it, but it seemed like a really intense kind of project, you know, for him. It, it really, it really is, and that's why I was so pleased when Larry's like, "Hey, you know, you talked to my dad like, you know, twelve years ago. Could would you be interested?" I'm like, Larry. Every time I've wanted to, even prior to the heart attack, he'd right. have little health bouts. I'd talk yeah. to Mike Gold because I know he and Mike would would right, stay right. in good touch. And I'm like, you know, I'm thinking about talking to Denny. It's like, oh, it's not a good time. And I'm like, all right, a right. couple years would pass and things like that. So right. I'm so glad in 2018 we had these three conversations. Yeah. And it yeah. was like, oh, thank God. And and you know, man, and I reached out when when the uh, when the pandemic hit. I really did like worry about a lot of the creators that I've become friendly with, mm -hmm. the older creators. I wanted to make sure everybody was okay. And I'm also doing that with. I already lost my parents, so I feel that. Right. Uh, connection right. to my friend's parents anyway. And right. it's just everybody doing okay. Anybody need anything, whatever. Right. Right. And I reach out to Larry and Larry's like, yeah, Denny's not doing too good. And I'm like, right. right. So I kind of, I right. kind of knew it was coming. But, yeah. 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 It wasn't, it wasn't a total surprise. Yes. But it was like, oh, okay. Still you know? Yeah. Yeah. So sorry. And you, then, man. and, and yeah, like anybody who's passed away, he didn't pass away because of the coronavirus, but no. anybody who did, it's just like that, that just totally sucks. You know, yeah, like yeah. you live all this time to then get sideswiped like that, you know? Yes. And I know that happens with global pandemics, I guess. I mean, it happened a hundred years ago. It's happening in our history. Right. People get wiped out, man, which is why we have to double down. Look at our superheroes who wear masks and just wear a mask when, you know, when you go around people, just do that. Can you do that? Come on. The fact that it's become a, a culture war debate over, just helping people, helping each other. Yeah. Well, what I want to say to people who are like, if I'm getting political, sorry, but no like, worries. Who are like, the government can't tell me what to do. I'm like, but do you stop at a stop sign? Is the government telling you to stop so you don't hit another person with your car or on a bike yes. or a pedestrian walking? Like, there are some just common sense rules, right? Why don't you just do that? It doesn't hurt you. Yeah, it sucks. I don't love wearing a mask either. You know, uh, in fact, Whitney got me one I haven't worn yet because I don't want to mess it up. It's it's uh, yeah. golden. It's the Golden Girls, you know, with the art there. Was, and, uh, oh, hilarious! <laughs> I was wondering why you had it worn. I was like, oh, maybe he hates it. No, I love it. I just don't want to mess it up. You know, like, <laughs> it's all right. Blanche can take it. Blanche can. Oh yes, she can. <laughs> yes, she can. Wow. That's fantastic. And who can forget um, B. Arthur's contribution to the Star Wars uh, celebration special? Yep. Oh, so there is yeah. a golden girl in Star Wars. That's well, all you need to know. You know, yeah, I, I, I go ahead. Sorry. Oh, well, I, I just just related to B. Arthur. Look, I haven't made that many <laughs> comics, but I did weirdly. <laughs> I did this weirdly. is amazing. This is amazing. <laughs> I made it. Uh, how long is that? It's pretty long. It's like, it's like 50 I, pages or something. Yeah, I made like a big comic all about B. Arthur. It's her life story. Oh, and that's awesome. Drawn in my very crude style. Hey, support me on Patreon. I think at the $5 level, you get to read my full length B. Arthur comic. Wow, yeah. if that's not an incentive, I don't know what is. And I'm going to put that in the chat. Patreon.com slash Whitney Matheson. Very nice. That's excellent, man. And if I'm correct, <laughs> that's the one fact you missed was the Star Wars one. Or did you yes. put that in there? You're correct because, yes, you told me that. You, you That was <sighs> your note. That was your note to me. My note. Well, yeah. That's all right. I, I've been bugging Dean to uh, uh, do a graphic novel about his godmother, Shelley Winters. Oh, mm -hmm. Shelley. 
Amazing. Because Amazing. well, because you know, and especially there are as as you both know, you sometimes when a celebrity when people become aware of them, it is in their later years. And there's likely a generation that only knows Jimmy Stewart as the old gunslinger in that Five Goes West cartoon and doesn't know the body of work. And Shelly in her later years would show up on Dinah Shore and the talk shows oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and just kind of seem to be in her own world at times. Yeah. And it's like, hey, yeah. Shelly Winters, A, had an incredible life and yeah. and was really like a, a real force in not only yeah. acting but and in film but in stage and directing and stuff. And that's why I'm like, Dean, she's like totally a woman that people need to be more aware of in terms of her. And I don't mean to put that responsibility on you. No, I, I, our next project. We got one out of the way today, so we need another one. So boom. That's, that's, yeah, there we go. There it is. I actually, like, just to, spr to spring off of something you were saying, John, about, like, pe more people need to know about Shelly Winters. Absolutely. She was amazing, you know. Uh, true, hardcore, you know, feminist without being a, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like she, she, she was tough. tough she was her own woman, absolutely, and a very difficult time to be your own woman. Absolutely. What with Oliver Reed? She's on Johnny Cars with Oliver Reed. He says something nasty to her. She throws her drink in his face. Like she didn't fuck around, you know. Like and growing up around her, I was like, whoa. She's, you know, I'm on Earth because of her because she introduced my parents. Wow. So my parents knew them her separately, and then she had this idea: you should meet each other. And then I came along. That's but, outstanding, man. But the, one of the things is like when you are around someone that amazing and you're a kid, you don't know this stuff. Right. I, I would sometimes go to a movie and be like, oh, she's in a, like we went to a play and then she had to, d to explain to us as kids like, oh, there's going to be a, a dead rabbit in the play, but it's a fake rabbit. So don't get freaked out. And of course, she's spoiling. Now it's called a spoiler. Right. But <laughs> back then it was like so we wouldn't cry or freak out or whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but hanging out with her in her living room, and then there's like just last week we were at my best friend's house watching Rope, Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, right? And one of the major actors, I'm like, oh, I hung out with that guy a lot, Farley Granger. Wow, that's because Farley Granger was Shelley's upstairs neighbor, and Insane. he was in two of Hitchcock's movies, a bunch of other stuff. Then there's Robert De Niro who babysat me, and I'm fighting over the remote control with Al Pacino. I don't know these people for how people know them. And all I could think about is if I had had the knowledge of who they were would become the questions I'd be, I would ask as a kid, but that you don't ask because you're just goofing around and playing around. And there's just, you know, cause yeah. after all, we are all just people, you know, Sure. but like the thing, the questions I want to ask Farley Granger about working with Hitchcock and he's passed away, both of them, you know, like, and, and because I became a cinephile and I became a storyteller and I, I care about this stuff. Yeah. And I want to know, speaking of human connection, like what was that like, you know, or what did you glean from that? Or what, is there a little story that nobody else, know? whatever, you know, it's why we talk, you know, to get this stuff, you know, and, and it invigorates us, emboldens us. I agree, man. No, Whitney knows. Uh, I mean, I, one of my favorite podcasts is Gilbert Gottfried's podcast ironically, because you can easily just blow Gilbert off as this goofy comedian. And he is so into Hollywood. And thank God he he and Frank Santo Padre, they get these great interviews with Bruce Dern, who worked with Hitchcock and can tell Hitchcock stories. Or Lee Grant can talk about being blacklisted in the 50s and stuff. And I, I, I guess you're a fan as well, Whitney? Oh, yes. Show? Yes. I love that podcast. Wait. You know, Dean, I sent you a link. I don't know if you I haven't listened to I it. I haven't listened to it yet, but yeah, yeah. Whitney just sent me a Godfrey link to Alan Arkin. And Adam, I love Alan they're Arkin. both together. And Adam. And Adam. That's right. It's, amazing. Yeah. it's fantastic. Oh, I love, yes, I love that podcast. I love um and there's a documentary about Gilbert Gilbert, Gilbert Godfrey that's also fascinating. Just to see what his life is like, and he's just a dad making sandwiches. And yeah. Yeah. That's great. But I love those I, I love um and another kind of old Hollywood podcast, you must remember this. Katrina Longworth, absolutely. Oh my gosh, this season is just knocking me down. It's so good. The it's yeah, the contrast between because Turner Classic Movies yes. is doing this great study of Peter Bogdanovich with Ben Mankiewicz interviewing him, mm -hmm. and Katrina releases her uh, version of the story from Polly Platt's perspective and Polly Platt's entire career. 
And um, yeah, man. No, I hear you, Whitney, because honestly, Polly Platt's someone that I likely saw on Easy Riders, uh, Raging Bulls, that documentary series that I have seen made. Okay. And, and I think she okay. was part of that. I believe she was part of that because it was of that generation of filmmakers and stuff. And yeah. I didn't know half the things she did outside of working with Bogdanovich as she did and being married to Bogdanovich. And oh. what, a, what an amazing story. No, she's incredible. And I'll, I always bring this up to uh, let um, people know that I, I do intend and also force my, that I'm working on this and intend to make it happen. In the style of You Must Remember This, I want to do one about boxing history because yes. that period after Joe Lewis uh, stopped being champion into the early 60s when Ali became champion and the IBC, the International Boxing Club, was a real legitimate business, but they had no choice, but they worked with the mob because so many mobsters had fighter contracts and they controlled boxing for like a good 15 years, a little bit more than that. And it, there's some incredible stories in there of fixed fights and Sugar Ray Robinson making 10 cents on the dollar when he came back and regained the middleweight title. And everyone, there's a great moment where he's crying in his dressing room and they catch it on camera. And everyone thinks, oh, wow, he's so happy about, you know, being champion again. It's like, no, he knows that these guys, he has no choice but to work with them. So they essentially so, own him and he's making 10 cents on the dollar. My second play, Harry Carey Kane, is about a guy who died a year ago and doesn't know it. And then we find out what, why, what happened, all that. But where he, he was a, a, a pugilist who died in the ring. And then you find out part, part of what's going on here is he wasn't true to himself because he was basically forced to throw a fight and I won't get much into it, but it cool. totally speaks to what you're saying, you know? And then I think I've told you this in the past, but when we were trying to come up with an idea uh, with Picar for our graphic novel that eventually became the quitter, which was for all intents and purposes, his origin story, right? One of the ideas he had was to do a history of Jewish boxers. And he wrote like a, a little thing about it. And I don't know if you ever uh, wrote comics that were drawn in his oeuvre, but I remember preparing and, and looking at certain boxes that I thought I was going to be drawing this comic. And then it transitioned to this other idea, the quitter. Uh, but he, he was totally into that uh, idea as well. So, Well, yeah, because yeah, again, I mean, boxing was this way that so many, uh, you know, uh, it would get out of the uh, lower state, you know, the ghettos essentially. I mean, even right. Hunter, right. lightweight was known as the ghetto wizard. And or, I mean, or the red hook is, is started off as a boxer who kills somebody by accident. I mean, like I totally get that. It's a, yeah. you know, fighting your way literally out of a, out of a situation, you know? So, and I, and one, another thing that I don't know how much we can talk about Whitney is a, what is an interview we've been doing for a, a podcast. Series. Oh, right. Well, that's you. You decide how much, how much we can say. I mean, I mean, listen, we we can we can tell John everything, right? <laughs> um, just the three of us. Just nobody the three else. of us, right? Yeah, nobody's watching. Don't worry about it. So, so for, <laughs> for, for many years, um, my dad's been telling me these incredible stories. He knew Marilyn Monroe for the last eight years of her life. Uh, he was wow. friends. He's written books about it. You know, so that was one major thing I grew up around. And the amount of, let's just say, Hollywood, Babylon type people he knew, you know. So he's this incredible story. And what started off is just kind of like one visit up to my dad in Long Island and interviewing him with Whitney uh, turned into what, four or five sessions? Well, yeah, I think maybe four. Yeah. Okay. And we got a lot of material that uh, oh, yeah. hours. shape. Hours. Hours. Yeah. That we're going to shape into this incredible interview. Uh, you know, I'm a little biased because it's my dad, but you know, I can remove myself and go, "Wow, what an interesting person and story." And I think it was also because Whitney and I were trying to figure out what would be a cool podcast podcast project, and we came up with a few. But one of them was Whitney loves older New Yorkers. You know, older people have things oh, to say. People, yeah. You know. And because yes. we're in New York, but also any anywhere, right? Absolutely. Like, they have absolutely. a life. They have a story. Yep. You know, absolutely. So I don't know. That was that's where it began. And then we chose my dad as the guinea pig. 
And I was like, oh my God, there's so much stuff here. So yeah, yeah. we're going to try and shape something in, into that. You, you know, know, the the great studs Turkle, I mean, you know, working his wonderful uh, oral history, first oral history book. And I got to know him a bit in his later years. Oh, wow. he, he, oh yeah. He's an, he's a great inspiration to a lot of what I do. Wow. And uh, yeah, man, no. And you know, this American life, I think Ira Glass does a great job of that as well when he, mm -hmm. when he talks to anybody, but no, you realize that the the elders actually do have a lot to share with us because of perspective and i think as we get older we appreciate that more my aunt yep. just passed away two years ago she was 98. she shares mm. a birthday with ray harryhausen she would have oh, been 100. Wow. would have been 100 wow. this year and yeah she was she was incredible and luckily in her later years for the family because she was the keeper of all the family history i i sat her down I learned that um, my mother, my grandmother's brothers were projectionists in Chicago during the Nickelodeon and silent era, the very wow. early silent. And they're the ones that sponsored her to come over. That's cool. Who knew? Who uh, knew? That's cool. Crazy stuff like that. So yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's excellent. I, I'm glad. And it's great. You know what? Chicago Public Radio at Navy Pier, one of our big uh, attractions, they have like an oral history area that you can sit down and actually record mm -hmm. when when things return to some sense of normalcy i'm sure more people will take advantage of it mm -hmm. but no you're right about that I, well how do we know where we're going if we don't know where we've been it's that simple. absolutely and, and it, yeah, absolutely and and again I, I think you need like to get older and feel your age a little bit to really start to respect oh wait a sec i mean when i was a kid i'm 53 when mm -hmm. i was a kid you were supposed to respect your elders. Now I don't know how much of that happens with kids today, you know, because we're canceling everybody left and right. You yes. know, you got because you got to put people in context. Agree from their era and their time. Agree. And yeah, we need to change so much stuff. I of get course. it, but like put some context to to, to people. You yeah, know? don't erase it. Put it no. in context. Put it in yeah. context because it's important. Be oh, you know, uh, literally, Gail Simone and I were talking last week, mm -hmm. and and I'm like. God, especially, and you guys know it too. I mean, if you really start canceling all this stuff, you're going to wipe out a hundred years of Hollywood. And and Every, don't get me wrong, there were a lot of casting couch assholes and people yes. that didn't respect other other right. uh, races and and orientations and women uh, right. and the like. But art was made, and also um, people moved forward despite those barriers. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I I always point to, and I know it. Uh, forgive me, everybody, I, but. Uh, the Charlie Chan movies, I know that the lead character was never played by an Asian, but there were right. a lot of working Asian actors that did manage to get right. important parts and further their career because of those things. Right. What right. do you do with that? Well, I mean, like, like you, know, you know, Mickey Rooney got to play in it. <laughs> yeah. Sadly. I'm, 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 oh, yeah. That to me is such a farce, what that characterization, that sure. I can't even look at it as a... a an Asian person. Of course. And I'll probably be slapped for it, but that was just so beyond like what was, I don't even know what that was, you know? So I look at it in yeah. the, with that perspective. Um, actually, wasn't there something today? Every time I wake up, I don't like looking at Twitter and a lot of social media, but we have to. What was going on with Spotify today? Like you're trying to. I don't know. Tell me. I, I don't know. When something about see. Joe Rogan. Oh, well, you know that he what made happened? this huge deal. Oh, did something affect the deal? Because, yeah, he signed – He um, at the end of the year, the plan it was or is that they were you would only be able to get Joe Rogan's podcast on Spotify. And he made over $100 million to license it for however many years. Yeah. So I think people are getting mad that, that maybe he's making a lot of money, whereas the bands that – get a few pennies from spot is that what it is it a money thing then probably i know i know i know joe rogan po polarizes people yes is, you know but yeah, i also think that it's important to have all kinds of voices i could right hey man i love his show and yet i don't know uh, here's something simple that i disagree with him on i believe he's someone that doesn't believe we made it to the moon he's a moon denier can i say that my <laughs> mother i i have to ask her again but she years ago told me yeah i don't think we went to the moon i'm like what? <laughs> mom, mom, and how about? But then, but then concur. Then, then at one point, I said, "Well, what's your favorite word?" And she immediately said, "Potato chip." And I'm like, "Why potato chip?" She's like, "Listen, listen how you can say, it. potato chip." And that was her answer. And I'll, it'll always stick with me. I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. 
Well, <laughs> anyway, moon denier they, potato chip. Well, to, and on the subject of moon denying, there was that early 70s movie that I absolutely love and I cannot believe has not been remade 40 years later, Capricorn 1. Oh, yeah. Oh, where yeah. Where they fake the Mars landing. Yep. Yep. Oh, it's so great, Whitney. It's fantastic. Uh, and it's, and it's yep. the weirdest. It's the best cast looking back now. It's James Brolin, yep. Sam Watterson, and O.J. Simpson are the That's astronauts. Right. That's right. Oh, and my it's, God. It's, it's a fantastic early 70s movie. Hal Holbrook and Elliot Gould and Brenda Vaccaro. It's a serious Brenda movie. Vaccaro. Wait, Brenda Elliot Vaccaro. Gould in this movie? Okay, all right. Capricorn, Capricorn 1. All right, everybody. all right. And it's running on... The uh, the streaming channel that does sci fi stuff, Dust, Dust is streaming it, and Dust is a free. Dust? I love. I've never even heard of it. I was going to say, and I continue to discover, and this is another reason why I wanted to talk to you, Whitney. I keep discovering these great smaller streamers that have ads, so they're free. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, I, we all know, or we may know, Tubi and Pluto and some of these others. But yeah, Dust is great, and they show a lot of short uh, sci fi films and a lot of weird obscure Canadian sci-fi television and things like that. Oh. But yeah, Capricorn one. And I know if you have yeah. Roku, you can get it. That's I'm on it. Capricorn one. I'm on it. I've written. I'm telling it. you, I'm telling you, you'll, you'll love it. You'll absolutely love it. It's a great movie. So, so not, not to leave <laughs> Jeff Burant out or whoever is rested that, that preview. Can, can you pop it up again? And we'll just, sure, man. Scroll yeah, we'll keep, yeah, we're going to continue to screen uh, scroll. Absolutely, man. Here we go. So we were on Ellen cause we did, so, uh, so Ellen yeah. did this really cool story where uh, she talks about having anxiety during this time and then uh, looking to her mother who used to impart these like little bone motes of wisdom, you know, from Al-Anon. Yes. Which was a, a, a cool little story and, and how to cope with, the, you know, uh, these times. Uh, Taking one day at a time. And it's kind of for people who don't know, Al-Anon is kind of family counseling Right. When someone in your family has an alcoholic problem, that's right. That's right. So, and using that, that, that you know, the 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 lessons of that, let's say, uh, yeah. to, to transition to to what you know, it, you don't have to be an alcoholic to feel this way. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Or to have someone in your family to deal with this kind of stuff. Oh, here's Jeffrey wrote this with Krista Cassano artwork. It's a two pager called Iterations of the Apocalypse, and I was a little jealous of this one uh, because Jeffrey. Uh, does what I love, and I think Whitney too, like where he equates the pandemic or, you know, uh, contrasted that is to uh, some of our popular uh, pandemic, you know, pop culture, like yeah, Why the Last Man, The Walking Dead. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, oh, God. Uh, Omega Man. Yes. Uh, but he does it around the, the, the bookend is that of, of him trying to get food and, and deciding I'm going to use the, the push cart that I used to get food, I'm just gonna keep rolling it to my house. And nobody stopped him. And how, you know, that push cart is still outside his doorway right now, you know, case. but like, but also kind it's just beautiful little story, you know? No, it's beautiful, it's fantastic. And here we go, here's Dean's story. Here's his mind about the appreciation, I call it the currency of community. Uh, I think about that kind of stuff all the time and how uh, the clapping uh, was a little jarring at first, because again, I didn't understand it until I, I understood the context of it. And so in this case, the Red Hook doesn't understand what it is. He thinks it's a warning, this clapping. So he's trying to run the food as quickly as possible uh, to his to these neighbors. And then he finds out from one of his neighbors uh, what the clapping is all about. And yeah. it kind of throws him for a bit because he realizes he's been working really hard, like a lot of the first responders, and you don't take that moment for yourself. And you realize it's kind of a scary moment, you know? To, to be acknowledged for doing something that should seem normal and, and maybe a little extraordinary and realizing that you are putting your life in danger by helping out others who can't help themselves, you know, not, not necessarily. And, and that we all need this kind of, you know, protection yeah. and acknowledgement. And that's, that's what I was trying to, to say with this story. And then I think there's, yeah. th thank you. And I think there's one more. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, Owen. you know what? Uh, did we say that Krista Cassano did the art for? Yeah. Yep. Death yes. Death? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And Krista Cassano drew the first half of uh, John Leguizamo's Ghetto Clown graphic novel oh, that wow. she was nominated for an Eisner for. Oh wow! Uh, and then Owen Brosman kind of ends the anthology with this thing called Quarantine Age Dream. That's this nice silent story about you know 
what happens slowly over time, but he takes it to the future yes. with his story. Yeah. And I thought that was a, a good, we thought it was a good way to end it and end this anthology, you know? Yeah. Um, kind of with a positive high note, you know, things have changed. Yep. What are they? We don't exactly know, you know? And then we have our contributors. And then finally, um, yeah, the, the bio pages. And then finally a reminder that this is all, uh, all the, oh, sorry, there's Mike Cavalier's amazing pandemic cover, <laughs> back cover, but also there's the message is wash your hands, wear a mask. Indeed. And then the Hero Initiative where everyone deserves a golden age and that this is what all the proceeds are going to. Absolutely, you know? man. Yeah. And again, no, this was like, like, even though the, the, the email went out about two and a half months ago, let's say, and I actually drew my story in April, you know, like I was done. And I wanted to show it to everybody, but I knew I wanted to wait, you know, like everybody you. else. But like it was relatively done quickly. And we're the first anthology to put out something about the pandemic. Uh, and in comics, the <laughs> cart is still there. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, and oh, Spotify yeah. announced today support for video podcasts. Yeah, oh. I'm not sure how that works. I, I, huh. You know, we're balloons on Spotify. Um, they didn't. They didn't pay me anything. I, I just <laughs> put it there. For oh, exposure. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, why not? Right. Thank you, Hillary. See, uh, Hillary is one of the one of the great cartoonists. Hillary Thank will you, be Hillary. on Word Balloon tomorrow night. We're doing a, a scene missing podcast where we talk old movies, deep dives, oh. like Capricorn One. Ooh. So, so you had tweeted something about. I thought you wanted to do something about the odd couple, right? Is well, I did. I did because uh, I, I'm, and I think Pfeiffer, I'm going to have to ask him tomorrow. Um, and I, I, but yeah, I was like, because I love not just the movie or the television show, because both are amazing, but even just the history of the play and the various mm. iterations that have happened. I mean, yeah, I don't know any of it. Like, I'd have to listen to your podcast about it. Well, I'm know? hoping that I hope I, I can gather enough people that also know Bendis knows, but Bendis is always A, too busy and B, yeah, never yeah. wants to reveal that he's our age. And oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm teasing. Okay. He knows. He, yeah. he, 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 he's cool about his age. But he'll say old man. And I'm like, dude, you're two years younger than me. Just there relax. You <laughs> he's your age, Dean. So, yeah. It's like, I'm like, shut up. You know every reference yeah. that I make. Because we will be like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, yeah. you do. <laughs> come on. I'm like, of course but, you do. But I do love movies. And that's another, I mean, again. Well, you can join us sometime, man. Seriously. We'll I, talk, I we'll might, talk I might have to. Because. Like Hill, Hill and Will Pfeiffer go like really deep. Like Hill loves noir and really loves digging into. Do you say Pfeiffer? Yeah, Will Pfeiffer. Will Pfeiffer, the writer. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was Pfeiffer. It's Pipe. I I think it's Pfeiffer. I usually call him Pfeiffer. I'm gonna have to ask him. And he, and you you said that. I mean, I I maybe I've been saying it wrong in my head. I, I don't know if I've ever said his last name to him. I was going to say I can't remember the last time I've I've talked to him where if he if I am saying it wrong he's corrected me. I is will it ask PF? him. Is yeah, it it's PF. PF. So yeah. I say Whitney. Do you know PF? Was it E I F E R? Yeah. How would you say that? I don't, Hill, if you're still watching, are we saying it right? Is it Pfeiffer or Pfeiffer? Yeah, I would. I would ask. I will. You, oh, yeah, you're I not know Whitney Shepard. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to ask Whitney Shepard about that. Whitney Shepard would know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Jesus. Well, oh, people get weird. my – they never get my name right. I'm always pleased when people actually do. That was, that was like, the best thing when uh, I saw Dave Gibbons, and I had met him before a couple times. But eventually, again, another project that I put out there because it will make me do it, the Word Balloon book, eventually I'm going to transcribe these interviews because oh, you know, yeah. I've really been fortunate to talk to so many people. You know, I, I, whenever I see Dave Gibbons, he's such a sweetheart. Oh, he's not going to let us know. No. Hillary Barton. Uh, but uh, Dave Gibbons looks like a European hitman. <laughs> Doesn't he? All right. Doesn't he? I like it. He should be like in um, – oh, who's the guy? Like Max uh, Moncito in Three Days of a Condor, Joubert. Well, or that, but no, but I'm also thinking he should be. Who makes those movies like with Brad Pitt? He was married to Madonna. Wait, was he married to Madonna? Yeah. Oh yeah, What's um, the, Guy Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie. He should be like he should star in a Guy Ritchie movie. That's hilarious. He's got such a great look and and, and a posture about him. <laughs> Dave Gibbons. He he's like a Hollywood act. Look at that guy. He's well, he was you know he was a mod back in the early sixties. Yes, and he which did that I graphic. loved. Right, uh, the, original. the originals, yeah, yeah the yeah. originals. So, so when I first when I saw him, it was at it was at San Diego. It's this time of year, and it was after hours. 
And I'm like, Dave, when I go, eventually I'm going to get my act together and I'm going to write a word balloon book. I hope we can include, you know, your interviews. He's like, oh, John, of course, whatever you need. And then he said, <laughs> and then he said, but you know, I'll read it years from now and say, oh, that fucking Suntress, he misquoted me. And I'm like, wow, you even know how to na- say my name right, man. That, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I sometimes will say Siantris, and that's I know okay. it's Suntress. It's Suntress. I know. Well, then that, that's but. phonetically, you would think it would be Siantris. Or and Haspiel. Is, it's Haspiel. You yeah, know? They, did a, so. they did a job at my grandfather uh, at Ellis Island. I don't know what exactly happened. I always think of when Billy Crystal does his joke about Ellis Island, and it's like, name Menachem Blachem. Yeah, Al right. Jolson. Keep moving. Al Jolson. <laughs> you know what freaked me out? So there's hardly any Haspiels in America. H A S P I E L. And I'm watching the news the other day, and often people will misspell, mispronounce my name Haspil. Sure, sure. Like like P I L. Yeah. And I'm watching the news the other day, and there was this like CEO who they found headless and armless like a week ago in a, in where you know in 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 Manhattan, which is gruesome. And they found a power saw, and they finally busted the guy, and his name was something Haspil. I'm like, whoa, whoa, time out now. Wow. What what do you? And then I had to look at the spelling to make sure it was P-I-L because how they mispronounce Haspiel. And I was like, did they find another Haspiel in America and he's cutting people up? <laughs> but it, that wasn't the case. So unless he took the E out of his name. Anyway. <laughs> That's outstanding. Anyway. Should we should we wrap, guys? I I, uh, I love that I love this conversation and I really appreciate yeah, uh, where we went with it. Do, do, Whitney, do you have anything that you're working on that you want to talk yeah, about? Yeah, please, or? exactly. Yeah, let's uh, promote anything. I mean, I is for anyone uh, who has small people in their life. Um, I did. I write sometimes for Epic, which is like the Netflix of kids books. So it's like a huge digital library of kids books. They have deals with all the major publishers. So um, during the pandemic, uh, well, I know it's free in all public schools and libraries in the U S but my daughter, like most kids have free access to this website to read. Um, so last year I wrote a book called, uh, we make comics, which is all about how comics are made. And I interviewed a bunch of people who make comics for kids. Um, so that's on there. And then soon I'll have a book on there about the Loch Ness monster, which is very about as far from the other one as possible. But, uh, you know, so I've I've got that, and then I don't I, various things. I I can't think of many many projects, but those those also come to mind. Do Definitely. you link Do you link to your stuff when you when there's something new on Instagram and and your Twitter and everything? When oh yeah, I always yeah I always okay. talk about it nonstop. So yeah. so give give people your Instagram and and Twitter handles. So on Instagram, I'm the Whitney Matheson because there's another Whitney Matheson and it's always like a competition to see who can get first. And then on Twitter, I'm just Whitney Matheson. But then also you can, yes, go to my Patreon, at, which is Whitney Matheson. And you can yeah, get all, and Whitney and Matheson. all of this stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Very cool. It's great. Uh, Whitney has a great Patreon. She has a great newsletter. At least subscribe to the newsletter, you know, and then you'll get some good stuff. But Lots of lots of innovative. Uh, I, Whitney's like a Renaissance woman. She does a lot of different things very very well. It's annoying. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so for me, I've been working during this time not only on this side project, the pandemics thing, but I've been working on uh, the Red Hook season four. It's going to be called Blackout. Okay, uh, it's something I wrote at Yado uh, last fall. And I'm about halfway done drawing it, and we hope to launch it, I believe, in September for Atline Webtoon, the free web comics app. The coolest free, thing in the world you know, that always deserves more exposure. And I know globally, Webtoons is such a big thing. I was just talking to Charlie Adler mm-hmm. last yeah, week. Yeah, they're, they're, they're doing this. It's not COVID 19, it's 19 Dovic or something, yes. or 91 Dovic or whatever. Yeah, Dovic of, 91, uh, yes. Yeah, like uh, Dovic 91. It's like a pandemic anthology with different artists doing different chapters or something like that. Yeah, and it's very if you remember the if you know the CW show The Hundred, it's very much like Earth is dying, so they send off 
right. uh, children to populate another world. Right. And that's kind of the, the right. conceit of the of the story. No, right. it's really cool. And also Katie Cook. I was talking to her about her uh, Katie Cook. Line webtoons uh, comics uh, and everything. Jeffy Burant, who's been popping up on this podcast, has a, uh, a comic on webtoon as well with uh, Sean Von Gorman, the artist. So they've been uh, publishing as well. So I have three Red Hook comics up there. It's the Red Hook, War Cry, Star Cross. The fourth one we call Blackout. And because I have a lot of time on my hands, I'm not hanging out as much as I used to. Uh, I've basically written the plots for seasons five and six. If I'm allowed to do them, we'll see. So please, people, read my free web comic. On webtoon, will, will you eventually yeah. collect? Have you already started to paper collect? So, those? so I've collected the first two through Image Comics. Yes, Re uh, Red Hook, uh, New Brooklyn, and Red Hook War Cry is volume two. Uh, but because honestly, the sales weren't that great, uh, and and I love Image, but I might put a halt on it for right now, and then maybe collect an omnibus either with Image or another publisher. I'm not sure yet. Sure, that would be. I don't want to reveal the title yet. It's it's the perfect title. Uh, that would en encapsulate all the stories. In fact, my play, The War of Wu, or War of Wu, was it The War of Wu? I can't remember now. Uh, <laughs> was basically a prequel to uh, yeah. The Red Hook. Oh, wow. Uh, there was a little, little, little moment that happens that makes a connection. So anyway, uh, and I'm trying to I'm, think of other things. Go I'm ahead. just excited for season five of The Red Hook when he meets Shelley Winters for the first mm, time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys got to make this book. Come on. In I'm the past. You. I'm telling Whitney, you. Whitney, why don't you write it? Well, actually, just read Shelley's great memoir. It's such a great memoir. Alone, it is a great It is know. a great book. Absolutely, man. Um, no. All right. So we talked about some of these collaborations me and Whitney have been doing. I mean, we've been just keeping busy. And that's what I, I suggest to anybody yeah. listening to this podcast. If you're feeling like, I don't know what to do, or, or you've been watched everything in the world. Although... Somebody made a joke recently, like, oh, well, all the television's been made. We've seen all the television. No, you haven't. And in fact, you talking about the odd couple reminds me there's so much content already made, you know, for all these years that you haven't seen. And if you want to, it's there. And we can all be armchair experts in our podcasts about this TV show or that movie or that director or that writer, or whatever, right? Yes. Um, and and or, or like have you remember Masterpiece Theater with someone sitting with a monocle and an ascot and a pipe and they talk about the movie you're about yes. to watch? <laughs> we can do that again, you know, here on, on, online, you know, and, yep. and and share and curate the stuff that we love. I'm so tired of, of the hate. There's so much hate and 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 you know t toxicity. Yes. Why don't we promote the things we love more so than ever that before? We have the ability. We have the tools. Agreed, man. No, and that's what I've been doing with with Word Balloon and and these hangouts that I've been doing with the Benson sisters and and Tom King, and uh, you know, God, we're gonna have a hangout on Friday night. We're doing. A, I hate calling it this, but the the Benson sisters insisted, and I've got an image. Um, <laughs> uh, here it is. Oops, no, that's the little one. Let's see. Here it is, John Con. <laughs> John Con, yes. About that's it. Fantastic. I so love it. yeah, you know, I love uh I, I and, and again right now because of uh the terrible harassment that's been going on, the after hours atmosphere at a convention is certainly under scrutiny, as well it should be, because right. unfortunately a lot of bad behaviors were were taking advantage of it in a really shitty way. But taking right. away the best part of it, which was everybody relaxing, just hanging out, fans get to meet creators, creators yeah. get to hang out for the first time and get to know each other. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and so I, I just wanted to reach out to the Bensons and Tom and say, Hey, let's do a hangout. And they're like, you know, let's like recreate that atmosphere. So they invited a, a they invited like a dozen creators from yep. Judd Winnick and Dan Slott, and Nicholas yep. Scott and uh, Amy Chu and, and a lot of great people. And so we're all just going to hang out and we're going to start hey, it like I, I we may crash. Maybe we'll crash your Friday night. You never please. know. Please. Seriously, you both are you both are, are absolutely invited if you'd like to join us. Thank you. Um we're going to That's start what I appreciate. That, sorry, that's what I appreciate about this. Or like I said early on in the podcast, dude, I I'd be sitting over here drawing and I'm like I listen to a lot of music and other stuff but I'm like, "Wait, some of my friends are talking right now. Why don't I just sit in on that and That's great. Listen man. and talk. And thank you for that. Oh, no, dude, please. That's that's the hope. And I'm glad that people get it and, and are enjoying it. And and no, we get to we get to hear interesting stories and, and everything. So no, you guys are both invited. 
and I'll give you guys all the details. We're going to start you. at uh, nine o'clock Eastern, if that's too late for parents, because you know it's it's both coasts. So uh, and I and right. you know and Tom's got kids, Tom King. So rather than start solo and everything, I'm starting with the Bensons at six p.m. their time. Right. And and right. no, no, we're going to hang out for a couple hours, and even if you guys want to dip in for like ten or fifteen minutes and share some stories, that would be, that would be great. Yep. Yep. John Con. Absolutely. John Thank Con. You. John Con. Yeah. Oh, I love it. There it is. <laughs> Tim uh, Tim Seeley drew it and Franco just, uh, Franco colored it. That's great. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I love it. So thank you. Well, that's great, guys. Seriously, uh, pandemics is uh, amazing. And, thank you. Um, and uh, yes, so go to Patreon.com/slash/pandemics and uh, and support this thing. Five bucks. Come on. Are you kidding yeah. me? And it goes to the Hero Initiative, a great cause that we all love and appreciate, and uh, supporting uh, really great creators. So it's gonna uh, it's gonna buy me adult diapers one day. I hear, uh, I hear you, man. Jesus, um, wow, right? <laughs> and that's how we ended the podcast. No. <laughs> Which is why I'm laughing. <laughs> way, to, way to wrap things up. I love that. That's beautiful. Hey. Well, thank I, you very much, John. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Seriously, I appreciate both of you, and this has been great, Wendy. It's been really great getting to know you a little bit better beyond your words. So that's terrific. And Dino, you know, I, I love you and you're, you're love hilarious. You too, so thank you both. Be well. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you very much. And please come back when you got new projects. Seriously. Both Absolutely. Of you. Always. Excellent. Always. Excellent. There we go. Right. Dean Hasfield, Whitney Matheson, and me. There you go. That's uh, wrapping up another word balloon. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Tomorrow night, like I said, we're balloon. Uh, we'll pre pre uh, present scene missing, and we'll be talking deep dive about old movies that you probably don't know. But uh, it's going to be Will Will Pfeiffer or Pfeiffer, depending on your mileage. I'll have to re ask Will. It's been a year since I've asked him about his last name. Hillary Barda, myself, Mike Cronenberg, who does uh, not only great work in comics, he does the covers for uh, tomorrow's uh, publications like Back Issue and Alter Ego and things like that over the years. He's also very involved with Noir City. Eddie Muller's uh, great uh, noir film preservation society that he's created. And uh, they run um, uh, movie festivals in big cities all the time. Well, pre COVID of course, uh, but that's going to be a lot of fun. That's tomorrow night, Thursday night, Greg Rucka comes back. We're going to talk about the old guard on Netflix because we're going to give you a chance to talk to him about that. And Lois Lane as well. That run has ended. But if you want to talk about Lazarus or black magic or any Greg Rucka stuff from the past or future, uh, Greg will be there for your questions and answers on Thursday night. And then Friday, once again, I'm going to put it back up there, John Con. That's right. I, uh, I I really wanted it to be word balloon after hours, but the ladies insisted. So thanks a lot for watching. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. As always, stay safe, stay happy.